At the Chong Ek Memorial in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, you'll find a stupa, a squat, tower-like structure used as a place of prayer and meditation by Buddhists. At a distance, this little building might seem like a good photo op, but if you get closer, you'll see a truly harrowing sight. Around 5,000 human skulls are stored inside. While this is horrific in its own right, 5,000 dead are the tip of the iceberg for what lays below in a mass grave known as the Killing Fields. And for this, we have one man to thank. Pol Pot, leader of the Khmer Rouge and orchestrator of the horrific Cambodian genocide. While he's rarely mentioned alongside other vicious dictators of the 20th century, like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, and Chairman Mao, proportionally Pol Pot is as bad as any of them, often credited with murdering practically a quarter of his own country during his four-year reign from 1975 to 1979. Pol Pot has left a legacy of torture, brutality, fear, and mass killings that left scars on the Cambodian psyche even today, over 40 years after the worst of his terrible violence. The man's cruelty and ruthlessness in carrying out his communist agrarian vision was the stuff of legend, and for many in Cambodia, even the mere mention of his name is enough to send a chill down their spine. So for one of arguably the world's most murderous dictators, responsible for the senseless slaughter of over a million of his own citizens, it's worth asking the following questions. Who was this man? And how and why did he come to power? And what horrors did he unleash on the citizens he should have been protecting? Well, first of all, Pol Pot wasn't actually his real name. Pol Pot was born in 1925 as Salat Sar in the small Cambodian village of Prek Sbav in the Kampong Tom province. He was the eighth of nine children. The Cambodia that Tsar was born into was once still under French colonial rule, which was naturally a point of contention between the Cambodian people and the powers that be over in France. Though Tsar himself was unlikely to have felt the ripples of this personally, having been born into a relatively well-off land-owning farming family. His family owned 50 acres of rice paddy, which was over 10 times the national average at the time. So it was fair to say that he lived a pretty charmed life early on. So just how did this upper crust one percenter end up murdering a quarter of his own country? Salazar would make for a terrible student, and his parents worried about his future. While not interested in education in the least, a young Tsar was immediately attracted to the revolutionary attitudes of Cambodian communists, especially those who sought independence from France. Salazar began using the revolutionary pseudonym Pol Pot, short for the French phrase politique potentielle, or potential politics. In politics, he found what he believed to be his true calling. So much so, in fact, that he decided to invest all his time in revolutionary activities rather than his schooling. As a result, he failed his next wave of examinations and had his scholarship revoked by the government. He returned to Phnom Penh in 1953 with a head full of dangerous ambitions, though it'd be another few decades before he could put the most nightmarish of them into practice. The same year Pot returned to his home country, Cambodia finally gained independence from French colonial rule after the people revolted against their European oppressors. This left a kind of power vacuum in the country that numerous political entities, Pol Pot and his communist allies included, would later attempt to fill. In the meantime, much like his fellow 20th century Asian dictator Chairman Mao, Pol Pot decided to pursue teaching while he kept his revolutionary plans on the back burner. He taught at Phnom Penh private schools between 1956 and 1963, specializing in history, geography, and French literature, and marrying his first wife Kiyu Panari in the interim. If Pol Pot had decided to settle down and invest himself fully in his teaching career, Cambodia would have been spared a lot of bloodshed and horror, but it's sadly not how this all played out. Pot spent his time helping to build up Cambodia's Communist Party on the side, serving as its secretary in 1960 and converting it to his particular brand of Marxist-Leninism. However, Cambodia's new monarchical rulers didn't take kindly to this kind of subversive activity and began a crackdown on communist groups that forced Pol Pot and his allies to flee Phnom Penh and take refuge in the jungle. There, Pot encamped with a group of Viet Cong before beginning his quest to reform his scattered own group into the Khmer Rouge guerrilla army a revolutionary insurgency movement who intended to pry control of the country out of royal hands. As Pot grew his forces and began launching his revolution in 1968, it was clear that what he lacked in academic drive he made up for in having an almost preternatural level of charisma and persuasion. One Khmer Rouge defector would later say, Pol Pot makes very powerful impressions on those who hear him for the first time. After that, they want to come back. Those who attend his seminars feel enlightened by his teaching his explanations, and his vision. He's like a father to us. Much like another one of his contemporaries, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, Pol Pot ran his political movement not unlike a cult, a group with a loose ideology congealed around a charismatic leader. 
Ultimately, what ushered Pol Pot into power were the conditions of absolute chaos occurring in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1970, a brutal civil war broke out between the forces of General Lan Nol and the Khmer Rouge. General Nol undertook a military coup while the country's ruler, Prince Nordam Sihanouk, was away on business, and the prince sided with the Khmer Rouge. And like almost all terrible events that occurred in the 70s, then US President Richard Nixon was involved. While a coalition of 70,000 US and South Vietnamese troops marched into Cambodia to root out the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong presence, Nixon was busy dropping 500,000 tons of bombs on the country over the next four years. It was a complete humanitarian nightmare for all parties involved. In the meantime, the violence committed by General Nol, the South Vietnamese, and the United States was radicalizing more locals into the Khmer Rouge cause, swelling their armies massively. By the time the US was finished brutalizing Cambodia with their bombing campaign, Pol Pot controlled three quarters of what was left, and after a sustained shelling and forced starvation campaign over Phnom Penh left the capital defenseless, the Khmer forces stormed in and took absolute control. On April 17, 1975, Pol Pot became the de facto leader of Cambodia. Many thought the end of the Cambodian Civil War would usher in a period of stability for the country. Little did they know that the worst was yet to come. Pol Pot had been planning for decades, and at long last he had the power to actualize those plans. Like many infamous totalitarian dictators, he wasn't after power for its own sake. He had a vision for his perfect country, and anyone who didn't fit into that vision was destined to meet a grisly end. Pol Pot wanted to take Cambodia back to its roots as a proud nation of grassroots farmers and laborers. Under the rule of Pol Pot, the decadent ranks of the educated, professional, and urban were public enemy number one. It was these academics who would meet the worst fates. One of Pol Pot's first insane actions was evacuating Cambodia's urban areas, including Phnom Penh, displacing and ruining the lives of millions. Professionals like doctors, lawyers, and civil servants were forced into re-education camps, stripped of their possessions, and made to work themselves to the bone in Cambodia's fields and rice paddies. If you dared to complain about the backbreaking work, then you'd likely find yourself in one of the Khmer Rouge's infamous detention centers, being tortured until you either complied or died. One particular detention center, the S-21, a former high school turned into a dystopian torture chamber, had only 23 survivors out of its 18,000 known prisoners. The brutality in these institutions under Pol Pot was so great that they had official torture manuals, dictating methods of interrogation, with choice excerpts like, Our experience in the past has been that our interrogators for the most part tended to fall on the torture side. However, we must nevertheless strive to do politics to get them always and absolutely to confess to us. Only once have we pressured them politically. Only when we have put them in a corner politically and have gotten them to confess will torture become productive. Pol Pot's minions often found that torture was extremely productive. Pot instituted a level of totalitarian control that made the dystopian world of George Orwell's 1984 look like a daycare in comparison. Among the things outlawed by Pol's Khmer Rouge regime were private property, jewelry, money, religion, gambling, and most reading material. If you defied these laws, you'd once again either be tortured, shot, or both. And even if you weren't personally executed by the Khmer forces, that didn't mean you were out of the woods. The horrific mismanagement of resources under Pol Pot led to widespread famine, leading countless Cambodian citizens to die from malnutrition. Their bodies were dumped into mass graves in the same so-called killing fields, with the body count ratcheting up to astronomical numbers. Pol Pot's supervillain-level dictatorship antics didn't end with all the horrific mass murder, torture, and starvation. He committed many acts that were as petty as they were strange and sadistic. The country was renamed Democratic Kampuchea, despite democracy playing no real role in the government. There were strict rules imposed on sexual relations, the clothing you could wear, and even the words you could use, in what feels like almost a direct tribute to Orwell's dystopian masterwork. In one particularly insane act, the country's rice fields were forcibly realigned in order to resemble the Khmer Rouge's checkerboard pattern coat of arms. In spite of these cartoonishly weird decisions, you have to remember that Pol Pot was a truly horrific monster. Under his command, children would be ripped from their homes and forced into mandatory military service by the Khmer Rouge, creating an army of obedient soldiers who carried out the will of their murderous dictator on pain of death. Men, women, and children were all horrifically victimized under one man's vision of a classless utopia gone awry, with anyone daring to speak out meeting a brutal end. In 1979, a large detachment of Vietnamese troops stormed Cambodia and captured Phnom Penh, forcing the power-mad dictator back into the jungle with his Khmer Rouge guerrilla army. There, with political support from the US and China, Pol Pot continued military operations for the next 10 years. 
The movement would finally totally collapse in the late 90s, following a ceasefire in 1991, and in 1997 a Khmer Rouge splinter cell would capture Pol Pot and place him under house arrest until he died of natural causes at age 72. Ready for more on some of the most terrifying despots? Check out terrifying story of Joseph Stalin's rise to power and why Mao Zedong was the most brutal tyrant.